The early owners of the land west of Braemar were the Earls of Mar, who under the feudal system held the land directly from the king. The Earls of Mar were the Erskine family, and in the show they may be referred to by either name, but both of these names refer to the same family group. After the 1715 uprising, all of the Erskine's estates were forfeited by the Crown. The superiority of the estates was then bought by the Duff family, who at that time held the title of Lord Bracco. Later they were to become the Earls and Dukes of Fife, so in the show this family may be referred to as either the Duff family, Lord Bracco, the Earls of Fife or the Dukes of Fife, but all of these names refer to the same family group. In the early days, the land west of Braemar was divided into four estates, Dalmore, Alanacoich, Inverai and Corrymalsey. Under the feudal system, the vassals or lairds who occupied these estates were the Mackenzie and Lamont families. As the Farquharson family, who occupied the Invercauld estate east of Braemar, expanded, they needed land for their children and by fair means or foul, they acquired all of the estates except for Dalmore. Eventually, however, the Earls of Fife bought out the Mackenzies and the Farquharsons, so that as well as being the owners, they were also the occupiers of the land. From the mists of time, the first evidence of human settlement in the uplands of Mar emerges at the chests of Dee, where recent excavations have found evidence of long and continuous occupation since about 8100 BC. These people would have been hunter-gatherers, and five and a half miles further upstream on the River Geldi, at Kuchan and Rui, a transient camp has also been found where the dwellers worked flint for the heads of their spears. By the first century BC, people lived in loose tribal groups and the areas that they occupied were presumably determined by who had won the last battle. However, it is thought that the Vagomagio tribe inhabited the territory that is now Strathspey, Strathan, Braemar and Strathardo. The Romans had a permanent camp at Inch Tuttle near Blair Gowrie, which could accommodate 5,400 legionaries. All those legionaries had to be doing something, so it is very likely that a patrol up Glen Shee discovered the wonders that lay at the foot of Glen Clooney. Richard of Cirencester recorded the march of the Roman general Genenus Tabellus, and one of his stops was at Tamia, which is taken to be Braemar, where he was defeated twice by the local inhabitants. This map shows the ancient track that ran from the north side of Loch Davin over the shoulder of Culbleen Hill, through the Pass of Ballater and up the east side of the River Gairn to Inverenzi. It then ran through Glenfenzi before following the line of the old military road to Alarg on Donside. In the legends of the Braes of Mar, King Malcolm is said to have travelled from the Loch of Canord to Braemar by way of the old Roman road over Culbleen Hill and in the same book there is also a reference to the old Roman camp at Inverenzi. The camp at Alarg is marked on the Ordnance Survey map. By the year 600, the seven Pictish kingdoms were well established. The dividing line between the two eastern provinces is generally regarded as being the Mounts, so Braemar would have been in the northern province. Dalriata was the Gaelic kingdom that encompassed Antrim in Northern Ireland and Argyllshire in Scotland. The Romans called these people the Scotti. The Battle of Clontarf took place near Dublin in the year 1014 between the forces of the King of Ireland and a Viking Irish alliance. The Vikings of Dublin lost and were reduced to a secondary power. The Irish annals record that the Moor Mayor of Mar in Alba was one of those killed in the battle, and this is the first known reference to the title. This map shows the extensive royal domain in green and the territory controlled by direct vassals in yellow. 
The remainder is coloured brown and is described as being the territory of theoretical vassals. I just love the idea of a theoretical vassal. For the first time, we have a map showing the area of the province of Mar. Douglas Simpson tells us that the ancient province of Mar comprised the district between the rivers Dee and Don, with the upper and middle basins of both, including the north bank of the Don as far eastwards as the western boundary of the parish of Inverurie and the south bank of the Dee down to the water of Fuch. The first Mor mayor of Mar is usually regarded as Rudri, who flourished about the year 1131 and is mentioned in the Book of Deer. The principal seats of the Mor Mairdom were Migvi and Dun of Invernochdi at Strath Dawn. Under the feudal system, of course, the Earl of Mar held the land from the king and leased it out to tenants, who were the lairds of the various estates, and they paid rent and provided other services to the superior, including military service. In Rudri's time, there would have been a wooden palisade round the top of the dune, which enclosed a building, or buildings, and a watchtower. Aloha Tower was built around 1368 by the Erskine family to guard the ferry across the River Forth. The Erskines were trusted aides to an unbroken line of ruling Stuart kings and guardians to the royal children. The Scots, led by the Earl of Murray and James II Earl of Douglas and Mar, were across the border causing havoc in the area just north of Newcastle when they defeated the English at the Battle of Otterburn in 1388. However, James II Earl of Douglas and Mar was killed in the battle. His sister Isabel succeeded him as Countess and she became the most sought-after bride in the realm and soon was married to Sir Malcolm Drummond. The couple resided at Kildrummy Castle, at this time the chief seat of the Earldom of Mar. In 1402 Sir Malcolm was killed by the infamous Alexander Stuart, illegitimate son of the Wolf of Badenoch, and two years later he forced Isabel to marry him and give him all of her lands. Isabel had no issue and Alexander Stuart's son died at a young age, so the Earldom of Mar then reverted to the crown. In 1565, to reward the Erskine family for their loyalty, Mary Queen of Scots restored the Earldom of Mar for John, Lord Erskine, heir to the Lord Erskine and heir of the ancient earls through a cousin of Isabel Douglas. John, Earl of Mar, was Governor of Stirling Castle and Edinburgh Castle and built the house at Stirling called Mars Wark. For the next 170 years the Erskine family continued to hold the highest offices in the land while the family gradually started to slip into debt. In 1689 John Erskine, the 23rd and last Earl of Mar, inherited estates that were heavily loaded with debt. He was nicknamed Bob and John for his tendency to shift his allegiance back and forth from faction to faction, whether from Tory to Whig or Hanoverian to Jacobite. He was regarded as a windbag and an opportunist. Following the Act of Union in 1707 and the accession of George I to the throne in 1714, many of the Jacobite landowners failed to find positions in the government of the new Protestant king. And without their government pensions and royal favour, they were desperate men. One of the big losers was the Earl of Mar, who, shunned by George I and heavily in debt, was stripped of his office as Secretary of State for Scotland and dismissed as Governor of Stirling Castle. So Scotland was ripe for revolution in 1715, and the destitute Earl of Mar was its natural leader. However, it required all of his talent for indecision to make the rebellion go off like a damp squib. Mar was an incompetent commander and wasted his advantage at Sheriff Muir, allowing Argyll time to regroup, and the rebellion was over after a single battle. The Earl of Mar fled to France with the old pretender, where he spent the remainder of his life and his estates were forfeited by the Crown. The earliest records that are available of who held the land in the Upper Dee Valley date from the 17th century 
and at that time the area was divided into four estates. The marches or boundaries of these estates were either the watershed between the two river systems or on a river itself. The Dalmore estate included the north bank of the River Dee from Mar Lodge to the White Bridge and both banks above that, the west bank of the River Geldy to Lower Geldy and both banks above that, and the valley of the River Louis. At the time when records began, this land was in the hands of the Mackenzie family and the best information suggests that it had been held directly from the Crown by them since the 15th century. Mackenzie of Kintail, a close personal friend of the king, was killed in a skirmish with the Buchans of Athol. The king, out of regard for his companion, made a gift of the Dalmore estate to the dead man's son, Kenneth Mackenzie. The first lodge to occupy the Dalmore was built by Kenneth Mackenzie soon after he took possession of the land, and in the best romantic fashion he married the girl next door, Beatrix Farquharson a daughter of the redoubtable Findla Moore of Invercauld. For over two centuries, the Mackenzies remained at Dalmore, where their stirring deeds are recalled in local legends. However, both Kenneth Mackenzie and his son James were present at the raising of the Jacobite standard at Braemar in 1715, which ultimately brought death and destruction to the family. The Dalmore distillery at Alness which used to be run by the Mackenzie family, produces a Mackenzie of Dalmore whisky. The bottle, complete with the Mackenzie clan crest, the 12-pointed royal stag, granted to the family by King Alexander III. The Allan Akoich estate covered the valleys of the River Derry above Derry Lodge and the valley of the River Coich. At the time when records began, this land was in the hands of the Lamont family, who were once powerful in the area. It is said that the Allan Akoich estate was confiscated by the Farkersons after one of the Lamont's sons was falsely accused of murder and it was given to Alistair, third son of Donald Farkerson of Castleton. It is not clear when that happened, but in 1632 Donald received a charter for the lands from the Earl of Mar. The Inverai estate covered the ground on the south side of the valley of the River Dee and the east side of the valley of the River Geldy, as far as Lower Geldy Lodge, and the valley of the Bynet Burn and the valley of the River Eye. The estate of Inverai was at the start of its known history in the hands of the Lamonts. Around 1620, the Lamonts, along with members of Clan Chatton, conducted a major raid down Dee side and laid waste much of Glen Cairn, Tullach and Glen Mick. Following this raid, the Farkersons moved against Lamont, who was arrested and hung from the so-called Hangman's Tree, which still stands just west of Mar Lodge Bridge. It was following this event that in 1622, the first Farkerson Laird was installed in Inverai, but only as a tenant. In 1632, he received a charter for the lands from the Earl of Mar. The Corrymalsey estate was tiny and covered just the valley of the Corrymalsey Burn. The first known occupant of this land was an Alistair Mackenzie, who received a charter from the Earl of Mar in 1632. The Farkersons of Inverai acquired the Corrymalsey estate in 1660 and added it to the Inverai estate. So after 1660, the Inverai estate looked like this. The Farkersons were descended from the ancient thanes of Fife through Shaw of Rothy Marcus. The Farkersons moved to the Braes of Mar by the marriage of Donald to Isabel Stuart, the heiress of Invercauld. They thus became vassals of the earldom of Mar until the 1715 rising, after which the few superiority of the forfeited estates of the Earl of Mar was held by the Crown, and the Farkersons were able to purchase few charters to their lands. Much of Upper Deeside was to come under their control, as there were branches of the family at Inverai, Alnacoich, Ochendrine, Invercauld, Balmoral, Tullach, Manaltry, Aboyne, Fingen, and Culps. There were also Farkersons at Bruff Jerig and Glen Shee, two and a half miles below the Spittal. Further afield, they also held lands at Mochlan in Ayrshire, at White House, and at Old Meldrum. 
Clan Farquharson were among the most loyal and faithful adherents to the House of Stuart, and Donald's son, Finlay Moore, was the royal standard bearer at the Battle of Pinkey in 1547, where he met his death. The Farquharsons fought for Montrose in 1644, Charles II at Worcester in 1651, the Viscount of Dundee in 1689, and they were the first to muster at the summons of the Earl of Mar in the 1715 Rising. John Farquharson of Invercald avoided becoming involved with the 45 Uprising, unlike his daughter Anne, who played an important role in support of Bonnie Prince Charles. She was to become known as Colonel Anne. However, Francis Farquharson of Minaltry, the Baron Ban, with 300 men, and Donald Farquharson of Balmoral, with 200 men, provided two battalions which fought in the centre of the line of battle at Culloden in 1746. The lands of the senior branch of the family, the Farquharsons of Invercald, lie just outside the area looked at at this presentation. However, the lands of the Farquharsons of Inverai, a cadet branch of the Invercald Farquharsons, are at the heart of it. John III of Inverai is the best known of the Inverai branch of the clan. He was known as the Black Colonel and he fought at Killiecrankie with Viscount Dundee in the aftermath of which he had to hide in the Colonel's bed in Glen Eye to evade the Redcoats. The Farquharsons and the Gordons were ever inclined to feud and on the 7th of September 1666, John Farquharson of Inverai, the Black Colonel, with at least 19 other members of his clan, came to Brackley Castle at Ballater with a view to driving away the Baron's cattle. They killed the Baron, his brother William, his uncle Alexander, and cousin James of the Knock. John Farquharson of Inverai, the Black Colonel, was a redoubtable, colourful and violent character. Throughout the troubles of the 17th century, most of the Scottish landowners had incurred massive debts in their support for either the Jacobite or Hanoverian causes. Their estates were run down and land was cheap. The Duff family, who were wealthy merchants and moneylenders from Banff and Murrayshire, were always ready to help local lairds with their liquidity problems and were even faster to foreclose on the lands they had been given as security. The Duff family very quickly became major landowners in Banff, Murray and Aberdeenshire. The Duffs of the northeast of Scotland are descendants of the great and ancient Macduffs, the Thanes or Earls of Fife. This picture shows the coronation of King Alexander III on Moot Hill Schoon in the year 1249. He is being greeted by the royal poet and the man on his right holding the sword is Malcolm Macduff the second Earl of Fife. The left side of the chart shows the line of descent from Adam Duff of Clunybeg through James Duff to Alexander Duff, the first Duke of Fife. The line continues through Princess Maud to James, the master of Carnegie. In the centre is Queen Victoria and we can see the link through Edward VII and Princess Louise to the Duff family. On the right side of the chart, we see the line of descent from Queen Victoria through Prince Arthur and Princess Patricia to Captain Ramsay, who built in Verai House in 1984. The red arrows show the inheritors of the title of Duke or Duchess of Fife. The yellow arrows show the inheritors of the lambs of the Maori state. From Adam Duff, the line ran through Duff of Dibble to William Duff, MP for Bampshire, who was created Lord Bracco of Kilbride in 1735 and Earl of Fife and Viscount Macduff in 1759, all in the peerage of Ireland, titles that were bought for money, but he did have to prove his line of descent from the Macduff, Earls of Fife. In 1735, the first Earl of Fife purchased the superiority of large parts of the earldom, including the Dalmore, Inverai and Alanacoich estates, from the Erskine family, who had incurred enormous debts as a result of the uprising in 1715, and these had to be repaid. In 1736, he purchased the land of Alan Akoich from the Farquharsons. In 1739, the Mackenzies sold the Dalmore estate to the Erskine family, who promptly sold it on to the first Earl of Fife. In 1744, he built Duff House. 
In the 1745 uprising, he supported the Duke of Cumberland and the Hanoverian cause. When James Duff, second Earl of Fife, added in Verai to the Maori States in 1786, the Duff family owned almost the entire catchment of the River Dee west of Braemar. So this is what the Maori state, as created by the Earls of Fife, looked like. The single biggest landholding in the history of the area. Old Mar Lodge and the entire area of the Maori state north of the River Dee was leased for shooting and fishing from 1830, first to Sir Harry Goodrich and then to the Duke of Leeds, who was to remain the tenant for many years. This arrangement left the Earl of Fife with no suitable accommodation for himself and his family in the part of the estate left to him on the south side of the river. His brother, General Sir Alexander Duff, had a cottage above the main road, just beyond the Corrymalsey Burn, which after the Muckle Spate in 1829 became the new home of the Earl of Fife. It was elegant rather than extensive and was known as Corrymalsey Cottage or New Mar Lodge. We will stick with the name Corrymalsey Cottage to avoid confusion with the other Mar Lodges. Corrymalsey Cottage is on the left of this picture with an octagonal summer house in front of it. In the centre of the picture is the original wooden fridge across the River Dee to give access to Old Mar Lodge. On the right edge of the picture we can just see Old Mar Lodge. On the 27th of July 1889, the 6th Earl of Fife married Princess Louise Victoria Alexandra Dagmar, eldest daughter of the then Prince of Wales. Two days after the wedding, the Earl was elevated by Queen Victoria to the dignities of First Duke of Fife and Marquis of Macduff in the peerage of the United Kingdom. The Duke of Fife had four sisters and David Cameron, the recent British Prime Minister, is the great-great-grandson of his youngest sister, Lady Agnes. An impressive group of 18 gamekeepers at Corrymalsey Cottage. And an even more impressive group of the Duff Highlanders. Note the stag's heads ornamenting the gables of the building. It is said that when the Duke of Fife, then in London, received the telephone call advising him that Corrymalsey Cottage was ablaze, he said only one thing, save the stag's heads. Here we see a game of skittles in progress at the estate office. This is obviously a very serious business and the pins are being carefully positioned for the next competitor, a job that takes two men and a pointer. At the other end of the rink, we see the bowler with the ball poised for launching and behind him sits the scorer at his table. During the summer months, the Duke and his family spent their holidays at Corrymalsey Cottage. Because he was now married to a princess, the Duke commissioned a substantial extension to the cottage. But during these works on the 14th of June, 1895, fire broke out in his grace's private room and immediately spread to other parts of the building. The fire was quickly tackled by workmen who were on site carrying out the enlargements and improvements and help was called in from Braemar. This was all to no avail as the greater part of the mansion house was furiously ablaze. They did not have enough water to extinguish the fire and the main building was completely destroyed. So what was left after the fire at Corrymalsey Cottage? This is the site of the main building, not a trace of which remains. The dairy and its associated buildings survived the fire and are still there today. The former estate office, built in 1897, has recently been modernised and is now known as Dairy Cottage. 
This building originally was the stables for Corimalzi Cottage and afterwards it was used as a sawmill for many years. In the late 1800s, the Lynn of Corimalzi was developed as a nice place for a walk for the guests at Corimalzi Cottage. Paths, footbridges and a summer house were built. In the early 1900s, a big storm blew down all of the trees in the Lynn, choking it completely with fallen timber. No attempt was made to clear the debris and the path, bridge and summer house were left to decay. Another walk contoured west from Corimalzi Cottage across the slopes of Craig and Vithick to this summer house which was up on the hillside above the Victoria Bridge. This photograph was taken in 1955. After Corimalzi Cottage was destroyed by fire in 1895, Mr A. Marshall Mackenzie of Aberdeen was commissioned to design a replacement building in the Elizabethan style of architecture. Queen Victoria laid the foundation stone on the 15th of October 1895 on a site immediately to the west of Old Mar Lodge. The stone was quarried on the estate and the timber came from the estate's own forests. The building was completed in 1898 and Old Mar Lodge was then demolished and the stables erected on the site. The finished building in 1903 with verandas at the end of both wings, a feature no longer present on the building. The stag ballroom survived the fire at Corimalzi Cottage unscathed and it was used to store what was saved from the main building. After the new Mar Lodge was completed and the salvaged artefacts were moved to the new building, the stag ballroom itself was dismantled and re-erected at its present site adjacent to the new building complete with its 2,435 stag's heads. This photo was taken outside the stag ballroom of the staff at Newmar Lodge around the year 1930. Donald MacDonald and Sandy MacDonald are brothers who we will meet again at Bynock Lodge in part three of this presentation. Pat Smith lived at Brigari. Ronald Scott was Bob Scott's big brother. Jimmy Phillips was an estate worker. Jockey Lamont was the son of John Lamont, the taxidermist, who we will meet again in part two of this presentation. Fred McLaren was a gardener and later a keeper, and he stayed at Mar Forest Cottage. Alex Grant was the well-known keeper on the Derry Beat from 1926 to 1937. This is Donald Scott, who became a keeper on the Mar Estate in the 1880s and lived at Mar Forest Cottage until 1898, when the family moved to the Lynn of Dee, where he stayed until his death in 1915. Donald was Bob Scott's father. This is the original wooden bridge across the River Dee, to give access to Old Mar Lodge, and it was opened by Queen Victoria in 1848. It was replaced by the Victoria Bridge, which was opened in 1905 by King Edward VII. In 1897, a suspension bridge was erected across the Dee at the west end of Mar Lodge Hoch. This was to provide access to an extension of the golf course, which then existed on the ground in front of Mar Lodge. Four years later, the estate took over 14 acres of Miss Grewer's holding at Craig View for further extensions to the golf course. In 1895, the Corimalzi Burn was chosen as the site for a hydroelectric scheme for Mar Lodge. Unfortunately, the reservoir proceeded to silt up and there was generally not enough water to provide electricity. The power station was housed in this small concrete building but the output was so poor that it was used to charge up batteries which were then used when lighting was required. The water was carried from the dam in a pipe, which as you can see still works, but the scheme was not much of a success and it was not long before petrol generators were introduced at Mar Lodge. Princess Louise of Wales, back right, her daughter Maud on the left and her grandson the Master of Carnegie taken outside the chapel at Mar Lodge in 1931.
The younger daughter of the first Duke of Fife and Princess Louise was Princess Alexandra, who was to become Princess Arthur of Connaught when she married her first cousin once removed. She was well known for her work as a nurse during World War I and later in South Africa, where her husband was governor for a time. On the death of her father, the Duke of Fife, Princess Arthur of Connaught inherited the Duchy of Fife and became the Duchess of Fife. In 1959, she was interred in family vault in the chapel at Mar Lodge. On her death in 1959, the Mar Lodge and its estates, including the Barony of Cromar and all titles therein, were passed to Captain Alexander Arthur Alfonso David Mole Ramsay of Mar, who lived from 1919 to the year 2000 and who was the only child of Her Royal Highness Princess Patricia of Connaught. However, Captain Ramsay also inherited the death duties and he kept only the part of the estate south of the River Dee, which retained the ancient name of the Mar estate. The part of the estate north of the River Dee was sold to the Ashford family and given the name of the Mar Lodge estate. In 1962, the Ashfords sold the Mar Lodge estate to the Swiss family of John and Gerald Pancho. They ran the estate as a commercial sporting venture and the lodge as a hotel.